to take out the outline that's in your worship folder. And you'll notice that I listed all the steps we've looked at so far, one through five, and then we'll look at the sixth step in, in a minute. But before we do that, I, I thought, you know, sometimes newspapers will print corrections. They can make mistakes, and they'll print corrections. And sometimes the corrections, I think, are just hilarious. Like, look at this one. This is a recipe correct, correction. In a recipe for salsa published recently, one of the ingredients was misstated due to an error. The correct ingredient is two teaspoons of cilantro instead of two teaspoons of cement. <laughs> oh, this is a great one. Uh, due to a typing error, Saturday's story on local artist John Henninger mistakenly reported that Henninger's bandmate Eric Lyday was on drugs. The story should, should have read that Lyday was on drums. The Sentinel regrets the error. Here's another one. Uh, a headline on an item in the February 5 edition of the Inquirer Bulletin incorrectly stated, stolen groceries, it should have read homicide. <laughs> and this was my favorite. This one's so mixed up. The Ottawa citizen in Southam News wished to apologize for our apology to Mark Stein, published October 22. In correcting the incorrect statements about Mr. Stein, published October 15, we incorrectly published the incorrect correction. <laughs> We accept and regret that our original regrets were unacceptable, and we apologize to Mr. Stein. Oh, you know, sometimes in, in trying to correct something, we make it worse. And step six is about correcting some of the relational damage that's been done to us and that we have done to others. And with God's help, we can do a lot better job than these newspapers did. Uh, let's look at step six. The sixth step in recovery is to evaluate all my relationships... Offer forgiveness for those who've hurt me and make amends for the harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. And this is based in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, that tells us, get rid of all bitterness. We need to forward a few slides. Uh, get rid of all bitterness. In fact, let me go over that step again then. Evaluate all my relationships offer forgiveness to those who've hurt me, and make amends for the harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Ephesians 4, 31, 32, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So there's two parts to this. The first part is God's calling us to forgive those who have hurt us. And then the second part is God calling us to make amends to those that we have hurt. So let's look at this step and how to do it. First, let's look at forgiving those who've hurt us. And a good question to ask is just why? A few reasons. One, first and foremost, because God has forgiven us. If, if you've been forgiven in Christ, then God expects you to share that forgiveness with others. If God has forgiven me, I should forgive other people. Colossians says, never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Sometimes when I'm struggling to forgive someone, all it really takes is for me to remember how much the Lord has forgiven me. How gracious God has been to me. I mentioned that these sermons are based on a series of sermons that Rick Warren gave on recovery. And one of the things he said in the sermon is, you will never have to forgive, you'll never have to forgive anybody else more than God has already forgiven you. I will never, he says, have to forgive anybody else more than God has forgiven me. God has forgiven our sins, all of our sins. And in comparison, we forgive just so little. When you have a hard time forgiving other people, it's usually because you don't feel forgiven yourself. Because people who are forgiven and really feel that warmth and that grace, they just can't help but forgive others. But if you don't feel forgiven, if you feel um, like uh, maybe God hasn't redeemed you, it, it, it can cause this sense of unforgiveness in us. It can make it difficult, make it difficult for us to then forgive others. We need to realize the grace of God, that we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. So we forgive because God has forgiven us. And then the second thing 
is that resentment doesn't work. Resentment doesn't work. I mean, that's the other option. Don't forgive. You're going to resent. You can hold on to it. And that's unreasonable. It's unhelpful. Unhelp- and it's certainly unhealthy. Look at these verses from the book of Job. In Job 5, he says, uh, Surely resentment destroys the fool. And then in chapter 18, it says, You tear yourselves to pieces in your anger. And then chapter 21, Some men stay healthy till the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Have you ever known anyone that died with a bitter heart? It's a tragic thing. It's a sad, sad thing. You know, resentment cannot change the past. It cannot correct the problem. It doesn't change the person. It doesn't even hurt the person who hurt us. It hurts us, doesn't it? It makes us feel miserable. Have you ever heard someone who's been resentful say, you know, I feel so much better (laughs) carrying this resentment around. You're never going to hear that. Bitterness just makes you mad and unhappy. And some of the most unhappy people I think I've ever seen are people that hold grudges. The third reason we forgive is because I need forgiveness in the future. And remember what Jesus taught us. He taught us in Mark chapter 11, when you are praying... First forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins too. So somehow resentment blocks us truly experiencing and feeling the forgiveness of God. And the Bible says we cannot receive what we are are unwilling to give. You know, you think of the Lord's Prayer and there is a statement Jesus taught us to pray. A portion of that prayer Jesus said we're to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So you think about that for a minute. I mean, isn't that saying, Lord, forgive me as much as I forgive those who have hurt me. Forgive me as I have forgiven those who've injured me. I mean, do we really want that? (laughs) We want, uh, Lord, forgive me so much deeper, so much more fully (laughs) than I've forgiven others. Now, Jesus says it doesn't work that way. We receive his forgiveness, then we extend that forgiveness to others. So let's talk about how. How do we forgive those who've hurt us? And the first thing, and this is so important, is that we need to reveal the hurt. Reveal my hurt. And this means to, means to admit it, to, to face it, to be honest about it. And the truth is, you can't get over a hurt until you first understand what it is and acknowledge that it's it's there so you reveal your hurt by telling yourself the truth and you really identify what happened to you and what you do is you make a list of those who've harmed you what they said what they did and you actually put that down on paper you get it in black and white so you can see it and you can deal with it you know, it's not this fuzzy thing that I resent, but it's a specific thing. And we can't go on to healing without looking at the specifics of those things. So you te- think about a teacher who maybe embarrassed you when you were a kid, or maybe a, you know, even mom or dad told you you'd never amount to anything. Maybe in a former relationship, someone was unfaithful to you. You get the nerve and write those things down. And it's a private thing, but you write it down and acknowledge that these things really happened. Allow God to reveal those things to you. And then you release the offender. You release the offender. You let them go. And that means you stop holding on to the hurt. And, and how do you do that? How do you seek to release an offender? There's, really, there's only one way, and that is through forgiveness. It's the only way you can release them to forgive them in the name of Christ. You don't wait for them to ask for forgiveness. You don't wait for them to come around. You don't wait for them to apologize. But you take that step in your own heart. Jesus said that ultimately forgiveness is a matter of the heart. And so you forgive from your heart. Uh, Just yesterday in the new members class, and we had a great time, Mark and I taught the class, and someone shared that they're having a difficult time forgiving someone and situation where 
they've had to forgive this person over and over and over again over the years, but this person continues to stir up conflict. And the person just said, you know, I'll be honest, I'm just getting tired <laughs> of forgiving. And I think we can all probably relate to that. And we looked at what Jesus said. We looked back to when Peter asked Jesus a question. Jesus was talking about forgiveness, and, and Peter said, Lord, how many times do we have to do this? You know? Lord, how many times do we have to forgive my brother? And then at the time, that day, it was, uh, it was known through the you know, legal or uh, religious law that a person was only obligated to forgive up to three times. So Peter says, you know, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother when he sins against me? He says, up to seven times? So Peter's being like extra generous, way beyond three. And then you remember Jesus' answer? No, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And that doesn't mean you do 490 and you're done. <laughs> right? it, it means it's infinite. It's a continual thing in some situation sometimes forgiveness isn't just a a one shot thing there's some people we have to forgive in our lives over and over and over again now i do want to say make this clear that in releasing an offender it is not always possible and it's not always wise or advisable to have that person continue in your life sometimes we need to set up clear boundaries and we need to stay away from that person and make sure that person stays away from us but there still can be forgiveness so how do you know when you've released an offender fully? Well, I think when you are able to think about that person and it doesn't hurt anymore, or when you find yourself being able to, to pray for that person and wish that person well, and you can even pray for God to bless them in their lives. Now, the truth is that you begin to understand not just your hurt, but their hurt, because Uh, it's hurt people that hurt other people (laughs) and they need god's grace and god's mercy too that's when you know you've released them when you can forgive them when you can think even well of them uh this thing about forgive and forget i don't know how some things we can't forget but we can forgive i mean can you forget a divorce no but by god's grace you can you can get over the pain Uh, it can stop hurting so you release the offender and then number three you replace the hurt with god's peace the bible tells us to let the peace of christ rule in our hearts and forgiveness sometimes it seems unfair like you might not have liked that last step the release the offender part uh you think you know if i really release this person then they're just getting away with it or they're getting away scot-free and i want to assure you that they aren't getting away with it when we forgive, when we release an offender, what we're doing is we're entrusting that person and that injury into the hands of Almighty God. And God is a judge. And he's a just and good judge. Now, you can take matters in your own hand and get resentful and you know, try to get even on your own. But I, I tell you, you'll just make a mess of it. You'll make it worse and worse and worse. God is the only one who can really do true, pure justice and god tells us that at a point in time it, it, it he will call everyone to account and he will settle the books one day when we forgive others we allow god to have the last word if we insist on having the last word it's going to be a bad word but christ if we allow him to have the last word it will be a good word and it'll be a word we can trust it'll be a word of justice so that's part one now let's look at part two uh we're to make amends to those that we have hurt so we not only deal with people that have hurt us and and usually that's where we stop in this thing we talk about forgiveness but now let's look at those that we have hurt those that we have injured uh what do we do but first yeah ask is is this really necessary we really have to go through all this and the answer of course is, is absolutely look at hebrews 12 15 it says, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. He's saying that the reason you can't get over this hurt, or maybe the reason you keep getting stuck on this habit or this hang-up, is because there's an unresolved 
conflict, there's an unresolved relationship in your life, and you need to deal with it. If you're really going to get on with your recovery and become healthy, then you need to make amends to those that you have hurt. So how do we do it? Uh, Let's look at a few things. How do I make amends to people who've hurt me? Uh, Number one, you, you make a list, another list, but this time it's those that you have harmed. And on this list, you write out what you have done, what you have said, how you caused the injury. So you might think, you know, I, I can't think of anybody I hurt, and so I thought maybe you'd say that, so I came up with a few, <laughs> a few starter questions that you're to ask yourself. Uh, and there's a few of these on here. A couple of them on here got me. Um, so ask yourself these questions. Number one, is there anyone I owe a debt to that I haven't repaid? I thought about my lawn guy yesterday. <laughs> I forgot to pay him for the last time he cut the grass, and that's, God just brought that to mind. And it, you know, maybe a small thing, but imagine if I didn't pay him. I didn't ever make that payment. Be resentment. There'd be hurt. Um, is there anyone in you owe a debt to that you haven't repaid? Is there anyone you've ever broken a promise to? And that's unresolved. If there is, you've got something to write. Is there anyone I'm guilty of over-controlling? Maybe a spouse, maybe it's one of your kids, a brother, employee, friend. Is there anyone I'm overly possessive of? Or is there anyone I'm hypercritical of? Have I been verbally abusive to anybody? Or physically abusive? Or emotionally abusive? Is there anyone I've not paid attention to or have not appreciated is there anyone I've been unfaithful to another question have I lied to anyone is that enough to get you started you want me to keep going (laughs) I think that's enough you think through those questions and, and, and more questions and you actually make a list of those that you've harmed and you're clear about what you did And the second thing is that you think about how you'd like someone to make amends to you. How you'd like someone to apologize or or come to you. And there are three issues that you need to look at. First is that when we apologize to someone, when we try to make amends, that we do it in the right time. Ecclesiastes tells us there's there's a time for everything. There's a right time to... You don't wait till they lay their head in the pillow. You find a time that's good for them. And you ask them, is there a time when we can sit, when we can talk? And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, not a great time for you. At a time that's best for them. And honor them by meeting with them at that time. Second is, besides the right time, is to come with the right attitude. The right attitude. Ephesians tells us, speak the truth in a spirit of love. You know, and that's really, it's possible. We can do that. I, I know back in the... Heather, you okay? Um, you're not. We're not. <laughs> what? <laughs> when? I don't know. <laughs> How far back do I have to go? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. I turned it on, which is good. So, uh, The right time, and then the right attitude. And I read Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth in the spirit of love. And I went to a couple of different Christian schools when I was a kid, and, and I found that anytime anyone ever said to me, I have something to say to you, and I say this out of love, <laughs> that was code for, I'm about ready to get hammered, right? <laughs> but there is a way to truly speak to someone in, in love, and that's to have the right attitude. But how do you want somebody to apologize to you? you know, uh, you'd want it privately with humility, uh, with sincerity, you know, if someone apologizes to you, you want them to simply say what they did and how they regret it. And they're not trying to make excuses, not trying to say, but, you know, you had a part in it. But they just own up to what they did to hurt 
you. That's a great thing that, that we can offer to others. Apology is a beautiful thing. And I think we've lost the art many times of, of truly giving a heartfelt, unqualified <coughs> apology. And part of this, this attitude, is to make restitution where possible. And I think it's something we've largely forgotten in our world today. But God calls us to repent. He also calls us to make restitution when, whenever possible. And that means if you borrowed something and you've not returned it, guess what? <laughs> you return it. If you owe someone money, you pay them back. Uh, and then there are things that you just can't restore. There's some things that you can take from someone that you can't just pay back. But what you can do is, is offer this sincere apology and tell them, you know, whatever I can do to make amends, I will do. And you leave it at that and, and see how God works. So the right time, the right attitude. And then finally, is it appropriate? Proverbs says, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. Word, words can hurt like nothing else. But words can also heal. And God uses good words to heal. Again, um, there are some situations that it may not be appropriate to contact the person. I was thinking, because um, uh, look at the qualifier. Remember that qualifier, the step is to make amends, except when to do so would harm them or others. So there are times when you just you don't go back. So it's unwise to go back to a, a person. You might open up a whole big can of worms or make the conflict worse. Um, like, you know, you don't go back to an old boyfriend or girlfriend who's now married and, and you know, <laughs> you've got an innocent party involved there now and, uh, you know, maybe if you've been unfaithful, you don't come back in contact with the person you were unfaithful with. It's just things that are terribly unwise to do. And so, instead you use like the empty chair technique. You write a letter and you pour out your confession to that empty chair and you leave that in the hands of God. Uh, and then the final thing is that we refocus our life. Refocus our life. And I love this step. Refocus our life on doing God's will today in our relationships. And, and that's what recovery is all about. It's all about dealing with the past so we can live in the future. Look at this wonderful passage from Job 11. It says, You must give your whole heart to him and hold out your hands to him for help. Put away the sin that is in your hand. Let no evil remain in your tent. Then you can lift up your face without shame. And you can stand strong without fear. You will forget your trouble and remember it only as water gone by. Water that's just gone downstream. So pour out your heart to God. Put your heart right. And release and forgive. And, and then we're to reach out to God, to reach out to Christ. And, and maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you haven't received his forgiveness. Today's the day to do it. And you simply call to God, God, I, I need your forgiveness. I've sinned against you. And Christ will forgive you. And then he'll give you the strength to forgive others. Human forgiveness, it was just based on our own power. It would just run dry. We wouldn't be able to do it. We're too weak. But God's forgiveness is a forgiveness that heals us and then allows us to extend forgiveness to others. And then you face the world again. You don't withdraw. You don't go and hide. You don't uh, hide in a shell, but you resume living. You lift up your face and you live without shame. You live without fear. Uh, notice what happens when we do that. It says we can lift our face without shame, stand without fear. And then we will forget our trouble and remember it only as water gone by. God is the one who could take our baggage away and set us free. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the great healer. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. And Lord, th thank you for taking all of our sins, past, present, and future. Thank you for taking those sins upon yourself and in dying on the cross. And coming back from the dead, you provided the only atonement that could ever be given for our sins, that by your grace and mercy, we are redeemed. 
we are set free. And Lord, you do tell us when we've received your forgiveness to, to lift up our heads and to walk without shame. And Lord, I pray as we think of those who've hurt us uh, and as we then think of those we have hurt, that Lord, you give us courage. And I pray that in the process of making these lists, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be so, so present and giving us comfort, uh, assuring us that it's going to be okay. He's with us. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that as we deal with these things in our lives, that, that we will sense that al although they're difficult and sometimes very painful to acknowledge, that you will guide us through it. And on the other side, we will receive your grace and forgiveness and, and mercy and healing like never before. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.